My name is Stephen Rogers, and on behalf of the Africa Faith and Justice Network, AFJN, I would like to welcome you all to our panel discussion on the topic, Redefining Crisis Responses, Unveiling the Sahel Dilemma and Innovative Engagement Approaches. AFJN is a non-partisan, pan-African Catholic faith-based advocacy network that is based here in Washington, DC, and works for a just US-Africa relations. We are comprised of more than 26 religious female and male congregations, and we work with several coalition members here in DC, as well as in Africa. We work with the US legislative, as well as the executive branches of government. And we also work in several countries on the continent of Africa, including Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Zambia, Democratic Republic of Congo, and so on. We focus on several issues related to development in Africa, including women's empowerment, governance, and um, sustainable, responsible um, investment, and other related African issues. We are 40 years old this year, and we will be celebrating our 40th anniversary on 40 years of advocacy, capacity building, and transformative education for and with Africa. So therefore, um, we will invite all of you to join us sometime in October. And if you are, need more information, you can join, you can go to our website, www.afjn.org. Housekeeping. I'm going to introduce our panelist, who is, who is going to be our moderator, Mr. Jack Bahati, who is a policy analyst for AFJN, and he has worked with AFJN since 2007. Mr. Bahati will introduce the panelists, three of them, and then um, in addition to that, there will be some, after their presentation, we will, you will be up, you'll be invited to ask questions. There will be live questions, and for those of you who would not like to ask questions live, we invite you to go to the chat and then submit your questions. Without much ado, therefore, I now, I now welcome Mr. Bahati and hand over this panel discussion to you. You're welcome, Mr. Bahati. Thanks. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. And um, uh, Stephen Rogers is our, our executive director, and we thank him for his leadership. Uh, we are very grateful that you are here today, and I hope you will continue to join us over time as we continue to uh, advocate for um, the people of the Sahel. So since 2011, since the 2011 NATO-led military intervention in Libya, which brought down the Libyan leader, Mohammed uh, Gaddafi, the Sahel has been awash with sophisticated military hardware that fuels the unprecedented armed conflict in the region. Millions of refugees and internally displaced people are now bearing the blunt of the insurgency, threatening a state of collapse from Mali to Nigeria. Given the decades long active uh, struggle of autonomist and secessionist movements, the Sahel geopolitics has become a complex puzzle difficult to crack and piece together. This panel discussion will try to unpack the underlying issues and the root causes of the escalating crisis with the objective of advancing Africa Faith and Justice Network's policy package proposal for lasting peace in the Sahel region. Here at AFGEN, we believe that passive observance is not enough. So together, we rise up today, calling upon the world to stand in unwavering solidarity with the people of the Sahel. Let us come with our voices. Let our collective voices shout the suffocating silence and condemn all who are complicit as we also demand 
swift and decisive action from those who have power to make a difference. So let us get ready for one hour and a half of revelations that will leave no heart untouched and no conscience unmoved. It is now my honor to introduce our first of three panelists, Reverend Father Barwende Midasani. He will be answering the following question. What makes military regimes so irresistible to the people of the Sahel region? Father Sane is a Jesuit priest from Burkina Faso. He currently is a, a fellow at the Africa Faith and Justice Network, our organization, and co-founder of l'Institut de Recherche sur la Paix au Sahel. He completed his doctor his doctoral studies in education, leadership, and administration at the University of San Francisco last May of this year. He holds a master's degree in theology from Santa Clara University, a bachelor's of art in philosophy from Université Loyola du Congo, and a certificate in public policy analysis from London School of Economics. Father Sané is an expert in environmental justice, peace building, leadership, Pan-Africanism, and human rights. He is also the author of seven books, which you can find on Amazon. And his most recent publication is Manuel d'Education à la Paix en Afrique, published in 2020. Father Sane, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Bharti. Hi, everyone. So I'm happy to be part of this uh, uh, panel and uh, alongside Colonel Sarah and Dr. Matt. It's our pleasure today to have you and to share our reflections on what's happening back in uh, the Sahel region. So my uh, main concern in this uh, talk is uh, to respond to this question, what makes military regimes so irresistible to the people of the Sahel region? So in June 2020, in June 28, 18, in June 2018, Pope Francis, during an interview with uh, a Western journal at the Vatican, expressed his views on Africans' relations with Europe. Quote, Europe should stop exploiting Africa and invest in ways that benefit the continent more, including by sharing mineral wealth and equitability. We must invest in Africa, but invest in an orderly way and create employment, not go there to exploit it. When a country grants independence to an African country, it is from the ground up. But the subsoil is not independent. And then people outside Africa complain about hungry Africans coming here, talking about Europe. There are injustices there. In our collective unconscious, there is something inside us that says, Africa must be exploited, end quote. This statement by the leader of the Catholic Church resonates with the deep-rooted turmoil in the Sahel region. One striking phenomenon in the Sahel, including countries like uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, it is the massive mobilization of populations, including both young and elderly individuals, to support military regimes. Many Africans share the analysis made by Pope Francis, and military regimes often cite these sentiments 
among others, to justify their governance. So when Dr. Bere will develop his talk, you will have more precisions concerning the entire Sahel region in terms of geographical situation. And Colonel Sarah will say more about it. My concern is about the visible mobilization of people in the Sahel region, the internal factors and the external factors. Why people are so mobilized around these uh, military regimes? The visible mobilization, what do we see? The mobilization of populations is evident in the enlistment of young individuals in the military. In Africa, especially in Burkina Faso, the military recruitment, I mean, in Burkina Faso, in this last month, there was a military recruitment launch in October 2022, aiming to enlist 50,000 volunteers for national defense. But it turned out to attract over 90,000 people, including both and women, and some of them are over the age of 60. Imagine the, the leader of a country launched a campaign for military recruitment and he got almost the double of people ready to say, give us guns and we will go to war, fight to defend our lands. This is very astonishing. And right now, still today, you have hundreds and hundreds of young people who come to join the military, the army, because they want to liberate their countries. With one sentence, give us guns, we will go back to our villages, and we will kick out these people in order just to work on our lands, especially through agriculture. While some human rights advocates, especially in the West, are expressing some concerns about potential human rights abuses, others see these populations rising to defend themselves against an unjust world that, appear, that appears more concerned about the welfare of a white population than that of a black population. So in the mind of these people willing to take the guns, they are sending a message to the entire world, telling them, listen, our lives, the lives of black people in the Sahel is not to be taken less than the, the lives of people in Ukraine and elsewhere. You don't only have to focus your eyes on people dying in Ukraine, you also have to do the same when it comes to the Sahel region. Because all of us, we have red blood running in our veins. You also have a financial mobilization and a material support for the war effort, especially in Burkina Faso. As of June 2nd, over 20 billion francs CFA has been mobilized to support the military endeavors alongside donations of vehicles, food, and oversupplies. The main reason is this. We have to understand that behind this mobilization, the Sahel population desire is just to survive and protect their lives. They see the presence of Russians, Iranians, and other forces as well as the potential involvement of military private companies like Wagner Group as a means to find allies who can assist them in safeguarding their lands and their lives. When you go to media, 
what people are raising in the West is just to say, listen, Russians, you, Russians, Iranians, North Koreans, they are going to take Africa. And of course, you see them hanging flags from these undesired countries. So my point is this. These people is telling the world, please, let us collaborate with everybody, even in people from planet Mars, if they can help us to survive. The geopolitical situations are not their concerns. They are not concerned about West, West, who is there. They are concerned about just living. The internal factors that justify these mobilizations. Of course, you have uh, weak institutions, you have poverty, you have the failure of governments to respond to the needs of young people. These are some of the reasons. You also have corruption there from the African leaders. And yet you have young militaries who are mobilized and telling people, yes, we have solutions for you. So these are the internal, the internal factors. So the first responsibility, if we have to keep in mind, among all of that is the failure of African leaders to respond to African problems by African solutions, with African solutions and the involvement of Africans. So we have to point first to the African leaders. But if we remain there, we fail to understand something deeper. It's what I call the external factors. The sense of marginalization in the world that exhibits stark wealth disparities. The main question that many Africans ask themselves is as follows. What is the purpose of the African continent in a global order that seems more interested in the continent's resources than in Africans themselves. Many others in Africa believe that Africa is genuinely of interest to the world without its African inhabitants. In other words, in other words the disappearance of Africans to free their continent would suit many, many, many people in the world. And I'm even wondering if some people are not praying to have Africans disappear from their continent in order to have them occupy Africa. So people love Africa, but without Africans. And you can feel it. You can feel this big and huge hypocrisy when you see all of these summits, reflections, discussions, global summits, yet the continent still has some problems. So it means especially, we love you, black people of Africa. We love your continent, not you. If you can move, we will show our love to your lands and your minerals. I call it a very dark and thick hypocrisy. And you have people of goodwill who look at that and they say nothing. I am proud of working of Africa Faith and Justice Network, who is raising the flag. And we shall make noise everywhere to tell people, wake up. Wake up because the blood of black people there is also red. And we must be more consistent. The sentiments of that the black lives do not matter in the eyes of the international community is evident when you see how people are mobilizing thousands and thousands, billions and billions of money to support Ukraine. Meanwhile, the African leaders are there and they are begging for, I would say, something less than that, but people don't look at them. The international community fails also to understand the Sahel region because the external powers operate with the logic. There is a logic. I call it a diabolical logic. I call it a satanic logic. 
It's this logic. Africa is a continent to be taken. Africa is a continent to be managed. Africa is a continent to be exploited. This is exactly the policy of the Conference of Berlin in 1885. When people gather together, together to divide Africa like a birthday cake, they have this logic. There is a continent there. Let us go and take it. I call it a diabolic conference also. Because diabolos means divide. And Pope Francis, when he went to the Congo, when he went to the Central African Republic, that was what he was denouncing. Meanwhile, the African military in Mali and Burkina Faso, they emphasize the sovereignty of their countries. And they are there also to accuse countries, European countries like France, who are perpetuating the plunder of African resources, including the France CFA. That is also another key element of people's grievance against the colonial power. And in all of these summits here in the US and everywhere, people are so polite, so nice, that they are not ready to tell the French, please, please stop immediately. We demand you to stop using this France CFA to continue exploiting people. Because when they are fleeing to die in oceans, it is not because their continent is hell. It is not because Europe is paradise. But it is especially because of the failure of their leaders and also your support of this failure through exploitation. The military and their supporters are also demanding, they are demanding the seize, the stop, the ending of the intermediation involving the colonial countries like France. People want to speak by themselves. People want to speak by themselves. They want the United States of America to stop going to Europe before speaking to Africans. Speak to us directly. People like me, the village where I was born, in the northern part of Burkina Faso, does no longer exist because it is occupied by terrorists. Terrorists who do not get their guns by making them, but terrorists who get their guns because some colonial powers directly or indirectly are also taking advantage of this disorder. So people like me, born and raised in villages of Kumbri, we are ready to speak everywhere and tell people, please, our blood is red, likewise yours. The fact that jihadists seem to be so powerful, more than national armies, it's also developing grievances in people. How can you imagine that people from the bush, they can get heavy guns, heavy military guns, more than national militaries? And when people point their finger to accuse the Western countries, it is not because they are naive. Nobody is naive. They just want to survive. Countries like Russia, China, Turkey, and North Korea are more attractive. Why? Because they respect people, cultures. Of course, they are not angels, but they are there for business. They are not asking Africans to change their cultures. They are not concerned about the number of children made by Africans. Their concern is not to tell Africans, you should marry like we marry here in the West. Their concern is to tell Africans, we are here for business. And of course, sometimes they also violate human rights, but they are more respectful in the sense of relations. When you have many devils in front of you, you have to choose the less harmful one. But nobody is the devil. I mean in terms of relations, people prefer those who come for win-win relations than others. 
And when you see what's happening in all of these regions, and you see the attention of people related to other concerns, you can understand why the military are so attractive. Conclusion. This is my conclusion. As long as the rest of the world continues to view Africa as a continent to exploit, rather than cooperate with military regimes and coup d'etat are likely to thrive in Africa. Not because it's good, but because people want power to help them survive. The military representing a potential force is in these countries, they will continue to enjoy support as long as Western military bases remains present in Africa. However, countries that genuinely respect African countries, countries who accept to respect African beliefs, countries who are ready to speak directly to Africans without relating to Europeans here and everywhere, countries who understand that colonialism is evil and we must stop it, these countries will also be very welcome in Africa and people will be listened people will be ready to cooperate with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Father Sani, for your remarks. Yes, the African people are ready to work with whoever. There are no exclusive relationships that have been set when it comes to Africa's uh, international relations. But uh, Europeans' uh, exclusive relationship with former colonial uh, um, powers uh, have undermined so much some of the progress that Africa could make. Our next speaker is Lieutenant Colonel Alain Sarah. He is going to talk to us about the regionalization of terrorism in the Sahel and its impact on sovereign institutions. Lieutenant Colonel Alain Sarah is a Burkina Bay, a military officer in the Burkina Faso Army. He holds multiple military and civilian degrees, including a master degree in law, economics, and management with a specialization in international relations, security, and defense, obtained in various military schools across Burkina Faso, the United States, France, Tunisia, Morocco, and many other places. His military career encompasses multiple roles and responsibilities, such as director of studies and prospective at uh, uh, the special staff of the presidency of Burkina Faso, chief of staff at the National Intelligence Agency, Intelligence Chief at the Eastern Sector Headquarters of the United Nations, uh, United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali. Um, intelligence Analyst and Chief of Intelligence Bureau at the Republican Security and Protection Group. He has received several military uh, decorations and Lieutenant Colonel uh, Alain uh, Sarah has also actively participated in academic activities as an instructor teaching courses on economics, intelligence and defense, geopolitics and geostrategy. He is also an author of articles and books, including Stratégie de sécurité économique pour le Burkina Faso. It is my honor to introduce uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alain Sarah. Lieutenant Colonel, c'est votre tour de nous parler. I don't know if your video is, is back on, but uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you very much for the floor. I tried to manage, but uh, I see that it's not working properly. Uh, it's a choice for me to prefer to speak in French rather than uh, English because I'm much more comfortable in French. 
So, so I'll, be, I'll be interpreting that for uh, Lieutenant Colonel. So please go ahead, uh, speak in short sentences so that I can okay. attempt to uh, accurately represent what you are saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, donc, uh, bonsoir tout le monde, bonsoir à tous les balinifs. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, and to you all and the panelists. Voilà, merci de me donner l'opportunité de m'adresser à vous. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Et nous devons parler aujourd'hui de la régionalisation de la crise sécuritaire au Sahel. We are going to talk today about the regionalization of terrorism in the Sahel region. Mais j'ai vu que l'impact sur les institutions était plutôt abordé par le premier intervenant et le dernier intervenant. Donc, je ne vais pas trop m'étaler là-dessus. I am not going to focus on the impact on the institutions because our first uh, speaker uh, has already uh, addressed that. Donc, quand on parle de Sahel, déjà, on parle de pan-sahélo-saharienne, on parle du Golfe de Guinée, on parle d'art de crise, on parle de corps de l'Afrique. Tout ça, nous sommes en train de parler de régionalisation d'une crise. When you speak we speak about the crisis in the Sahel, we are talking about the, uh, the Gulf of Guinea and the Horn of Africa, and all of that, we are talking about the regionalization of the crisis. Et quand on regarde aussi la menace terroriste, c'est une menace qui s'étend au-delà des frontières nationales. When we look at the, uh, the threats of terrorism, they go beyond uh, national borders. Uh, Par exemple, pour le cas du Burkina Faso, nous avons d'abord le foyer algérien. Uh, in the case of Burkina Faso, you have uh, the, uh, the, the, the region uh, linked to uh, Algeria. Et ensuite, euh, euh, la, je, pourrais, je pourrais dire la contamination du Mali. And uh, the, um, all the movement uh, of terrorism coming from Mali. Et aussi la progression vers le Burkina Faso et maintenant on parle du Golfe de Guinée. And then uh, it progressed uh, towards Burkina Faso uh, to, to the, uh, uh, the Gulf of Guinea. Donc quand on parle de régionalisation aussi de la crise sécuritaire, ça veut dire que vous avez des Maliens, des Nigériens, des Béninois, des Ghanaiens, des, des Ivoiriens qui se retrouvent dans les différents groupes et qui interviennent sur ce cet espace géographique là l'ensemble des pays qui sont qui sont dans le Sahel when you speak about the regionalization of the conflict you are talking about different people from different nationalities who are actors across these borders uh, of these nations généralement on parle de deux groupes par an les gens vont vous parler de al qaeda au maghreb islamique ils vont aussi vous parler de l'état islamique au grand sahara uh, normally you will hear people talking when it comes to this issue of two groups. Uh, you will talk about uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb or ISIS uh, in, the Sahara, in the Sahara region. Mais nous avons aussi des proto-groupes qui sont des groupes plutôt criminels et qui qu'on retrouve pas dans ces, dans ces deux grands groupes. Uh, but we have some groups uh, which are not uh, really uh, part of these major uh, terrorist groups. On parle surtout d'une menace qui est très complexe parce qu'elle est d'abord dynamique. We are talking about uh, a very complex uh, threat because it's very dynamic. Voilà, quand vous regardez les différentes cartes, euh, au Burkina Faso, c'est parti d'une seule région et aujourd'hui, presque toutes les régions du pays sont concernées. Uh, in Burkina Faso, for example, this uh, went, uh, it went from one region and now it's the whole country that is uh, uh, affected. On parle aussi d'une menace protéiforme parce que nous savons, parce qu'à l'intérieur du moins, il y, a, il y a de la criminalité. Uh, we are talking about uh, a protéiforme menace. I don't know what protéiforme means. Qui a plusieurs formes. Uh, it uh, a menace with many forms um, uh, because... I, 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 I did not get the last voilà, question. Voilà, c'est une menace qui a plusieurs facettes. Voilà, souvent on dit c'est du djihadisme. Ça, c'est l'aspect religieux. Mais aussi, on a de la rébellion. On a de la grande criminalité. 
C'est un mix de beaucoup de choses. So, uh, we are talking about uh, a, a threat that has many forms because it has religious uh, aspect to it. Uh, it has rebellion, uh, like uh, militia aspect to it. There is criminality also aspect to it. Donc, on parle aussi d'une menace diffuse parce qu'en même temps qu'on parle du Sahel, il ne faut pas oublier d'autres régions du monde ou même de l'Afrique qui sont concernées. Uh, we are talking about a, 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 a conflict that is uh, more general because this does not only affect the Sahel, but the whole continent. Aussi, on parle d'une menace qui est ambiguë parce que quelque part, on ne sait pas si c'est une menace de sécurité intérieure ou c'est une menace de sécurité extérieure. Also, we are talking about an, an ambiguous uh, threat because we are not really sure that whether this, uh, this threat is only internal or, or just external. So it's just ambiguous in that sense. Euh, je ne vais pas m'étaler sur l'historique euh, du, du terrorisme auquel nous faisons face, mais l'origine peut remonter aussi loin que la guerre d'Afghanistan. We are not going to spend much time um, um, elaborating on the history of terrorism, but uh, this, uh, the history of this terrorism can go as far back as the war in Afghanistan. Par exemple, quand on parle du Sahel, il faut comprendre que c'est plusieurs États. On parle de la Mauritanie, on parle du Mali, du Burkina Faso, du Niger, du Tchad, du Soudan du sud de l'Algérie, du Maroc, c'est vraiment un grand, un très grand espace. So, when we talk about the Sahel region, it's not just one country. We are talking about Mali, Niger, Chad, Mauritania, Sudan. It is a very big space. Et, 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 et jusqu'à présent, nous tentons d'expliquer la, la menace, mais les enjeux aujourd'hui au niveau du Sahel nous échappent toujours. Uh, right now, we are attempting to explain the threat, but the significance and the scope of this, of this problem still is a mystery. We don't have a comprehension of it. Mon prédécesseur a parlé des dynamiques endogènes, mais il y a aussi des réalités locales qui sont très complexes. Uh, my, uh, the, the first panelist uh, spoke about uh, the the internal causes, but uh, in, in, within these countries, there are so many complex issues. Et puis ce qu'il faut préciser aussi, c'est qu'il y, y a tellement d'acteurs qui interviennent au Sahel, que ce soit des acteurs légaux que des acteurs illégaux. We have to underscore the fact that there are many actors. Some legal and illegal actors are involved. Euh, je, je veux parler par exemple des, des, des acteurs internationaux. Nous avons les États-Unis qui sont engagés dans ce qu'ils appellent le War on Terror et qui utilisent donc différentes stratégies pour limiter l'étendue de l'influence des groupes terroristes au niveau du Sahel, mais aussi pour contrebalancer les influences chinoises et russes en Afrique. Uh, for example, uh, the international actors. We can speak about the US, the US, which is engaged in the War on Terror. But uh, at the same time, fighting the influence of Russia and China on, uh, in this space. Voilà, nous avons aussi euh, l'Union, voilà, l'Union européenne euh, qui, 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 voilà, qui, qui considère plus ou moins cette, cette, cette zone tampon là, voilà, comme euh, une zone de ce, voilà, où il faut euh, régler les problèmes avant qu'elle n'arrive. Euh, voilà, sur le continent européen, mais il s'agit surtout de trouver des solutions à tout ce qui est problématique euh, euh, migratoire. Uh, we have also the European Union, which considers uh, this space as a, a space where they need to have influence uh, for geopolitical reasons, so that no, no threat can get to them uh, coming from this space. And also they are trying to Uh, address the issue of migration into Europe. 
Nous avons la Chine aussi qui est présente dans un contexte de compétition mondiale exacerbée voilà, pour les ressources naturelles et puis euh, les, débouchés, euh, les débouchés commerciaux. And we have China, which is present uh, in, uh, in two ways, for uh, looking for a market for their goods and also for uh, um, the competition, uh, international uh, competition on the control of uh, uh, the resources. La Russie aussi, comme vous le suivez, est de plus en plus agressive en Afrique. As you know, uh, Russia has become more, more, more and more aggressive and present uh, on the continent of Africa. Donc, je vais parler aussi euh, du Canada, de l'Australie, euh, d'Israël, de l'Iran, euh, de, 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 les pays des BRICS, que ce soit la Turquie, que ce soit l'Inde, que ce soit le Brésil, voilà, qui ont aussi des logiques, euh, des intérêts, euh, voilà, au, au niveau du, du, du Sahel. Uh, I would also mention that uh, there are countries like Canada, Australia, Iran, Turkey, and uh, Israel, which also are on the continent because they have interest in this on the continent. In this voilà, je vais parler, voilà, je vais parler finalement des, des États arabes aussi qui, qui essaient de renforcer toujours leur influence religieuse et financière sur la région. And uh, we must also mention the Arab countries that continue to, uh, to strengthen their religious and uh, economic influence on the region. Uh, donc, uh, rapidement, je vais parler des causes du terrorisme parce que c'est très important aussi, à mon avis. And quickly, I would just go ahead and um, elaborate on the causes of terrorism. Euh, en fait, ce n'est pas une liste qui est ordonnée comme ça, mais c'est quelques points comme ça qui me viennent à l'esprit. I will not have, I don't have a very elaborate list, but a, a, few, uh, a few points I'm going to just uh, talk about. Euh, le premier point, c'est l'échec de l'État moderne. And the first point is uh, the failure of uh, uh, the statehood, the, the state as we know it. Donc, euh, l'État post-colonial n'est pas arrivé à répondre aux attentes des populations. So, the state has not uh, been able to, uh, uh, to answer, uh, to, to give an answer to the expectation of the, the public. Donc, nous avons aussi la faillite de la gouvernance, qu'elle soit politique, administrative, économique et sociale. We have uh, the failure of governance, uh, be it uh, political, economic, and uh, social. Nous avons ce que on appelle la mafiatisation de l'économie ou la criminalisation de l'économie. Ça dit que l'informel prend une certaine dimension de telle sorte que l'État n'a même pas un contrôle sur les flux, que ce soit les marchandises, que ce soit au niveau euh, des transactions. L'État n'a véritablement pas euh, le contrôle qu'il devrait avoir. And we have uh, the mafiatization of the economy or criminalization of the economy. Practically, you have the mafia uh, uh, in uh, these spaces, whereas um, the government is not able to, um, to manage, uh, control the merchandise that are coming in, any transactions, nothing. The government is um, practically Powerless. Donc, euh, je vais parler de la corruption généralisée, bien sûr. And I would um, also mention the uh, widespread corruption. La faillite des élites qui ont été incapables de transformer de façon qualitative la vie des populations. We have the bankruptcy of the elite. Uh, Uh, the, of the society who have not been able to translate what they know into some, something that is useful for the community. Je parlerai de l'analphabétisme. I would also mention the, the, uh, the illiteracy as a factor. La fragilisation du lien social parce qu'aujourd'hui euh, la famille, la communauté n'ont plus les, le sens voilà, qu'ils avaient. We also talk about uh, the, uh, the, the, the weakening of uh, the family 
uh, the value which were uh, uh, the family values which used to be are no longer the same. Il y a ce qu'on appelle en français l'absolutisation, l'absolutisation des extrêmes. Ça veut dire que nous sommes dans une situation où ce sont les extrêmes qui sont en train de monter en puissance. And uh, we have also the extremism, which is now more and more becoming uh, the norm. Voilà. Maintenant, euh, pour aller très vite, je vais parler de l'absence de, de perspective, notamment le chômage endémique. Uh, now I'll be talk. I'd like to talk about uh, the, the the lack of uh, hope. There is no vision for the future. Voilà. Les inégalités, les injustices. Uh, injustice and inequalities. Euh, L'occidentalisation des mœurs. Uh, we have the influence of um, Western cultures. Euh, le choc des civilisations. And you have the, the crash of civilizations. Ça veut dire qu'il y, y a toujours eu une compétition ou un conflit larvé entre le monde arabe et l'Occident. Et aujourd'hui, l'Afrique se trouve quelque part au milieu. And uh, as we know, there have always been um, the, a competition between the Western and the Arabic uh, cultures. And today, Africa is trapped in the middle. Je parlerai aussi du néolibéralisme, l'argent roi. Okay. Uh, can you repeat again, please? Le, le néolibéralisme. I would also mention uh, uh, the ne of, um, neoliberal liberalism. Uh, le réchauffement climatique et la raréfaction des ressources. And uh, we'll talk about also the impact of climate change and uh, the extracted industries. Donc, il y, y, y a tellement de choses. Je ne peux pas m'étaler sur, sur, sur tout ce que... Mais vous pourrez avoir ça sur le, le, le PowerPoint. Et, uh, euh, there are so much to say, but I will make them available uh, in writing uh, through my PowerPoint. Et, et là où souvent les, les, les gens se trompent, les, les, les terroristes ont un projet de société. Uh, what people do not know is that Uh, terrorism have a, 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 a plan, a social program. Pour eux, il s'agit de tuer l'État. And this program for them is to kill the state. Voilà, et se substituer substitu à lui à travers un contrat social légitimé par l'islamisme. And uh, become the substitute of this one Uh, through a state, an Islamic state. Bon, mais bien sûr, mon précieux, j'avais pris des de notes, je voulais parler un peu de, du terrorisme et l'impact plus ou moins sur les démocraties, sur les institutions. Mais toujours est-il qu'il y a un lien entre l'insécurité et les changements anticonstitutionnels. And uh, as my predecessor said, Um, it is obvious that there are um, uh, links between terrorism and uh, unconstitutional governments. And recently, we have talked about Burkina Faso since the second coup de the deuxième coup d'état l'année dernière. We have talked about the diversification of partners. Voilà, and the diversification of partners is a je dirais un souhait de la majorité des, des populations. Et je crois que mon prédécesseur aussi en a parlé parce qu'on trouve qu'on a besoin de certains soutiens pour progresser sur euh, euh, le front de la lutte contre le terrorisme. And um, uh, in the case of Burkina Faso, my predecessor spoke about it. We are hearing more about the concept of diversification of partners. And this is uh, actually the will of the people uh, in order to get hold of means to fight against terrorism. La principale difficulté de mon point de vue, euh, nous sommes dans une configuration où trois États sont en 
plein cœur de, ce, voilà, de cette spirale de, 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 de violence, là, notamment le Burkina Faso, le Mali et le Niger. And um, here we need to pay attention to, what, to a, a very difficult situation where you have three states in the, in the midst of all this, uh, all this terrorism um, going on. This is Burkina Faso, this is Mali and Niger. Maintenant, les différentes approches que nous avons en matière de, je dirais même de vision du terrorisme sont différentes. And uh, in each of these countries, the, 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 the perspective in terms of uh, how to address terrorism is, uh, is, also, uh, is also different. It differs from each country. Euh, pourtant, aujourd'hui, euh, surtout avec la réflexion scientifique, on sait plus ou moins ce qu'il faut faire pour vaincre le terrorisme. Uh, but uh, we all know uh, that uh, with all the research done, we do know that uh, the, the, we, we know what it takes to really uh, defeat terrorism. Uh, D'abord, je vais commencer par le niveau étatique. At the state level, uh, il faut une approche holistique de l'insécurité. You need to have a holistic approach uh, to the insecurity. Nous devons insister sur la sécurisation des frontières. We must address the, uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, securing frontiers, uh, borders. Nous devons empêcher les terroristes de recruter. Uh, we must prevent uh, terrorists from recruiting. L'État doit tout faire pour contrôler les flux financiers en général et travailler à désorganiser les financements des groupes terroristes. Uh, the state have to uh, control the, uh, the financing of terrorism and uh, do all it can to stop any financing of terrorists. Et finalement, ce qu'on peut faire au niveau national aussi, c'est de perturber tout ce qui est logistique des groupes terroristes. And then uh, we have to dismantle all the networks of um, uh, logis uh, logistic uh, of terrorism. Au niveau communautaire, euh, moi j'insiste d'abord sur la cohérence des politiques sécuritaires. Uh, at the community level, I insist on uh, the uh, uh, community, uh, the, secu the securing the communities. Voilà, ça ne peut pas marcher si chaque État travaille de son côté. And um, in this case, uh, we, it can't work if each country is, is working separately. Et nous devons, nous devons vraiment travailler à mutualiser aussi les, les, les efforts et les moyens. And we need to work to ensure that our efforts are, are synchronized. Our means are synchronized. Euh, merci beaucoup. J'ai essayé d'aller vite pour rester dans les 10 minutes. Thank you so much. I tried my best to stay within the 10 minutes allocated to me. Mais le, le document est disponible. Quand il sera traduit, il est beaucoup plus complet. Uh, the document is uh, available when it, um, after it is uh, um, translated, it is more detail. It has more details. Et merci encore pour votre attention. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Sarah, uh, for your uh, uh, presentation or your remarks. Now, we are going to hear from our third panelist and Dr. Matt Berry is going to talk to us about the evidence of the effectiveness of local peace building and conflict prevention initiatives in Niger and Burkina Faso. Uh, Dr. Matt is currently an interim manager of the Transforming the Mind for Peace Lab at the Carter, Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. And he is the uh, the founding member of the Centre de Recherche pour la Paix et la Sécurité au Sahel. 
Uh, this is a new non-profit organization based in Burkina Faso. He holds a doctorate in peace studies and conflict resolution from George Mason University. Dr. Matt uh, has more than 10 years experience in Sub-Saharan Africa, where he studied, worked, and uh, temporarily resided, um, namely in Burkina Faso, Chad, um, uh, Cameroon, Niger, uh, Ivory Coast, Kenya, and Uganda. As a peace and governance specialist at the USAID in Burkina Faso, and then as an independent consultant working with various organizations, he contributed to the monitoring and evaluation of several peace building and um, uh, uh, county, countering violence extremism projects. His research has focused uh, in the last seven years on uh, peace and security in Africa, especially uh, jihadist terrorism in the Sahel. So it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Matt. Please, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Bahati. Um, first, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, Africa Faith and Justice Network for inviting me to share with you um, a few research results and uh, also uh, my experience in the Sahel. In fact, I published a book in 2020 in French on terrorism in the Sahel, which is quite a quite comprehensive analysis of the causes, drivers of violent extremism and conflict in this part of the world and also the various responses to the crisis uh, that have been proposed uh, thus far. Um, uh, the book is available in French on Amazon um, and uh, you, you can get it to contribute to the discussion and to our work to address violent extremism and violent conflict uh, in the Sahel. Now, um, I would like to talk about what has worked in responding to jihadist terrorism and conflict in the Sahel? Because very often people have been talking about uh, the causes of terrorism. Um, they have also sometimes talked about uh, various approaches that have been taken to address it, but not much about what has worked and what has been effective in addressing the conflict and how people from outside can help. So this is the challenge that I'm going to take here. Uh, I'm not sure that all everyone in the audience here uh, knows about the Sahel, even though you might have heard about it. The Sahara Sahel region, the Sahel, is in fact an arid, desertic strip of land just located below the Sahara Desert. And that stretches from the Senegal to Eritrea. And uh, uh, it, it is comprised of the arid northern parts of many countries of West and Eastern Africa, as you can see here on the map. And this region is considered as one of the most vulnerable to, to the impact of climate change in the world. Uh, and it has a fast growing population that has been competing for declining natural resources. It's a population that is mostly youth. More than 60% of that population is, uh, is not older than 25 years. Um, and the countries of the Sahara Sahel region are regularly ranked among the poorest in the world, both by the World Bank and the UN Development Program. Uh, even before the jihadist crisis that we are witnessing now, this is a region that has been 
uh, vulnerable to violent conflict and humanitarian disasters. And uh, jihad in the, in, in the region, in fact, date back to colonial, pre-colonial times, according to, to some historians. Um, and we had uh, leaders like Usman Danfodio and others who have had uh, uh, struggles related to a, a version of Islam, a very strict version of Islam and expansionist one. Uh, the region has also been home to very powerful West African kingdoms and empires that are ethnic based and have been trying to compete with each other even before colonization. And these rivalries have continued after independence, uh, but not as intensely as before. Uh, but now what we are really concerned with, uh, at least since uh, the Arab Spring and the collapse of the Gaddafi regime in Libya in 2012, it's this wave of jihadism uh, with armed groups affiliated to Al-Qaeda and ISIS. These are groups, some of them will emerge locally, like uh, the Masina Liberation Front in Mali, in central Mali, uh, uh, the group for uh, the support of Islam and Muslims, uh, and Sarul Islam in Burkina Faso. Those are groups uh, that are local, uh, based on local grievances, and that have paid uh, declare allegiance officially to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, whose jihadist agenda they, they share. But besides jihadism, we have also uh, some long-standing conflict uh, in the form of insurgencies that have been uh, waged by Tuaregs, especially in Northern Mali and Agadez since the 1960s. But as Colonel Sara uh, 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 told us earlier, in fact, the crisis in, in the Sahel is multiform. Uh, it has taken various forms in, in the form of you know, transnational criminal uh, uh, networks, uh, 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 gangs uh, related to drug trafficking, human trafficking, and arms trafficking. And I, I provide a, a more detailed analysis of uh, these different forms of the crisis in the book that I'm going to publish uh, soon based on my doctoral research. Uh, now, why should the West care about what is happening in the Sahel, in this remote, impoverished part of the world? Why should we care about it? Well, for various reasons, there is much at stake for the West in the Sahel. First, you need to know that symbols of Western interests, Western cultures and influence are threatened or are being destroyed in the Sahel. And this is expanding to, uh, to, to other parts of West Africa and even Africa. Uh, hundreds of Christians have been killed or kidnapped in West Africa. Dozens of churches have been burned in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Sometimes uh, Christians in, in worship were killed, including pastors and priests. And more than 8,000 schools were forced to teach the Quran or Arabic or to close because they are considered as vehicles of Western culture and uh, Western culture and education are, are thought to corrupt the youth and to be incompatible with Islam. This is something else that is at stake for the West in the Sahel. Western interests and influence are also threatened by jihadist militants uh, who are advancing, trying to advance a specific political agenda based on the Sharia law and an extreme version of the Sharia law that is incompatible 
with what the West stand for, namely democracy, the rights of women, human rights, uh, 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 freedom of religion, and so on. And since some years, we have also been witnessing anti-Western rhetoric through disinformation campaigns that are sponsored by, by uh, Western rivals, especially pro-Russia groups. And uh, from my research in Burkina Faso and, and Niger through surveys and, and interviews, what appears very clearly is that the West is losing ground in the Sahel, in the minds and hearts of some people. Uh, because people are very disappointed with cooperation with the West, including in the fight against terrorism. And it is not surprising now that people are turning to Russia and even to Iran, North Korea, and other countries that the West considers as rogue state to seek assistance in the fight against terrorism. Um, Colonel Sara mentioned uh, the growing influence of China and Russia in Africa. This is in the whole of Africa. One thing that you need to remember is that China has become the first commercial partner of Africa. Russia is now the first and primary military service and equipment provider of Africa. This means a lot. Among the targets of terrorist attacks uh, carried out by uh, jihadist militants across the region, Western uh, citizens have been the favorite targets. Uh, many citizens of the West, including uh, religious leaders, have been killed or kidnapped. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, we have to acknowledge that there is an increasing number of young people who are joining these extremist groups that are hostile to the West, not because uh, they are convinced of the extremist ideology, but sometimes simply out of safety concerns. They, they join these groups in order to protect themselves, protect their families or their cattle, because they are left most often with only three options. Either you run away to save your life or you join them. And I was told by some interviewees uh, in Burkina Faso that some family had had to give an animal or one of their sons to these groups in order to be spared. Uh, think about it. Now, these statistics will give us a concrete idea of how the crisis, the violence has been spreading throughout the region. Uh, here uh, on this graph, you can see how the number of terrorist incidents attributed to jihadist groups has been increasing along the years, uh, not only in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, but also uh, in other countries of the region, including coastal ones, uh, who are more and more affected. Um, and not only the number of attacks, but also uh, the number of fatalities victims, people who have been wounded, kidnapped, or killed. You can see the numbers here. And the data come from a very reliable data source, uh, a database called ACLED, Armed Conflict and, uh, and uh, Event Locations, that collects uh, conflict and terrorism data from around the world. So it's a very reliable uh, data source. Uh, I just had to analyze the data and, and visualize them to facilitate uh, our communication. And now uh, you have here data from uh, the UN uh, High Commission for Refugees that gives you an idea of how 
the number of internally displaced people from Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Nigeria has been increasing along the years. As you can see, despite the various military counterterrorism operation and the international military mobilization, the numbers are not decreasing. If people are running away, what this means is that things are not getting better for them. Their security is not improving, right? And, and you can see here also, uh, this is from uh, the UN data that show the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs clearly shows that the humanitarian situation is not getting better. Not only for the Sahel, but uh, other countries that are indirectly or directly affected by the Sahel crisis because they have to welcome an increasing number of refugees. And you can see it here through the numbers. They don't have anything to invent. Um, so after listening to that, you will have a feeling that this is a deja vu. What can we do about that? This is a hopeless region and there is nothing much we can do. Yes, I think you can do something has uh, Father Medard said earlier, uh, what is needed to tackle the crisis in the Sahel is not out of reach. Uh, we have seen what has happened in Ukraine and how the international community has mobilized to respond, both uh, in terms of humanitarian assistance and military support. We have not seen even a third of it in the Sahel, and yet Anyone who is a respectable member of the international community has been saying that terrorism in the Sahel, violent extremism is uh, uh, a, a threat to international security and peace. But we have not seen anything meaningful being done uh, to support the Sahel government face the threat. Uh, of course, humanitarian assistance will be necessary but my point here in this presentation is to say that what we need is not only to wait for humanitarian disasters to, uh, to emerge in Africa before uh, uh, acting, we can do something to prevent even the need for humanitarian assistance. And I will show evidence here uh, to, 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 to demonstrate that this is possible. Prevention efforts, uh, local initiative to prevent such disasters and violent conflict exists and it works. Uh, and the evidence that I'm going to show you comes from the studies that I conducted in Niger and Burkina Faso uh, uh, based on a, a Reuters report uh, titled, Does this village hold the key to defeating African Jihad? After reading this, this report, I was quite struck. And uh, I said, well, so this is possible. Local leaders can do something with the support of external actors to help prevent conflict, to help prevent violent extremism and keep peace and security in some regions of the Sahel. And the report was about uh, mainly in a, a, a small village in Niger called Amatata. I checked the data uh, about Amatata twice. Uh, by the end of uh, June 2021, there was no terrorist attack or conflict incident or victim recorded in that village, which is located in a very volatile, uh, uh, sensitive region. And I checked back the data. In 2022, there were only two incidents of armed robbery uh, mentioned in that, in that uh, locality. And in the whole Agadez region of Niger, that has been the home of repeated Tuareg rebellions, peace and security and social cohesion have been maintained. Uh, uh, and yet, this is a region that borders very 
conflict region countries like Chad, Libya, and Algeria. And I also remembered that in Burkina Faso, we have a locality called Dori, the main city of the Sahel region. This is the most affected region by terrorist attacks in Burkina Faso. And yet that city has been more or less spared by the violence. I checked the data. By the end of June, 2021, there were only seven incidents mentioned in, uh, reported in Dori, the city of Dori. And only one could be considered terrorist based on uh, the international definition of terrorists uh, adopted by some, some governments. And yet both Dori and Amatata are areas located, as I said, in sensitive violent regions. So how do we explain that? How do we explain that people in this region have been able to preserve their localities, their communities from uh, the widespread violence in the region. Um, so this was uh, the focus of my research. And uh, to answer uh, my research question, I conducted uh, interviews with 30 key resource person, local actors that have been involved in peacekeeping uh, uh, peace building efforts, conflict prevention, or countering violent extremism initiative uh, in Amatata, Agadez, Niamey, this was in Niger, and in Burkina Faso, mainly in Dori. Uh, my, the interview data were collected in different languages, you know, French, but also local languages like Tamashek, Fulfulde, and Mori, with the assistance of uh, uh, with the help of some research assistants and interpreters. Uh, and all the data were translated into English and then uh, processed through thematic coding and analysis uh, with the support of NVIVO. This is a qualitative analysis software. Uh, the results are very enlightening, but I don't have time. I'm going to summarize them here for you. I got evidence from the data that if you give voice to local people, this helps better understand the dynamics and complexities of local conflicts, not in, only in the Sahel, but also in other parts of uh, the world. And this helps also craft more contextualized, relevant and effective responses to conflict. And secondly, I got evidence uh, that initiatives that are locally crafted and led by local people have helped maintain peace and security in some localities of the Sahel, like Amatatal in Niger and Dori in Burkina Faso. And they have been less costly than uh, many international interventions, including military interventions that cost billions of dollars. Uh, more specifically, my study has identified five factors that contributed to the preservation of peace and security in these localities. I'm going to go fast and, and just uh, mention these, these factors. We have local peace committees, uh, both in Niger and, and Burkina Faso. Many respondents mention uh, local peace committees. Those are committees formed by local people from different ethnic and religious backgrounds who come together to promote peace, social cohesion, tolerance among their communities uh, by taking various initiatives and monitoring threat to security in their communities. Uh, and it has worked. It has helped to prevent conflicts it has helped to resolve conflict uh, uh, peacefully. Uh, and second, uh, it was mentioned to me, uh, peace activism, peace education campaigns, and efforts to promote interfaith dialogue and tolerance by local leaders, mainly religious leaders, uh, traditional chiefs, 
uh, and, and also other community leaders. These activities have helped to promote a culture of tolerance. And as one leader put it, the tolerance and mingling of people from different ethnic groups and religious backgrounds has made it difficult for the jihadists to recruit militants, in, for example, in Dori. They could not find a window to enter because the prevailing culture of tolerance and interreligious dialogue has made it difficult for them to recruit supporters and, and followers, even though they propose money trying to recruit some young people. Uh, and Dr. Mark, try to summarize so we can have a few minutes of Q&A, please. Okay, so the, the last uh, three uh, points, uh, factors that were uh, uh, mentioned to me was the inclusion of former combatants uh, in peacemaking efforts, uh, the investment in, in income generating activities, especially for the youth, and the fact that governments made a huge effort to include minorities, former combatants uh, in uh, efforts to promote peace, especially after peace agreements. Unfortunately, there is little money that is invested usually in these non-military conflict prevention and peace building efforts, especially those that have been taken by local people. So my research is available uh at this link uh if you want to learn more about it thank you for your attention and this is what global leaders say about the soil crisis um it's a crisis that is forgotten and yet it has a lot of stakes for the west and for the rest of the world thank you thank you so much uh Dr. Matt, for your uh, wonderful explanation, which is um, advocacy um, talking points for the purpose of um, urgent uh, policy proposal for uh, lasting peace. Now, we are going to take a few questions. We started late. So we're gonna just uh, add uh, a few minutes so we can um, have some interactions. I would like to, op uh, to ask anyone who has a comment, a comment to open the mic or a question to open the mic and uh, speak. Anyone who has a question can open uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, thank you, Matt, uh, for your uh, wonderful, insightful presentation. I like the idea of um, non-military effort on peace building. And I'm wondering, like, whose initiative was that? Was it from the government or from a non-for-profit um, agency? All right. Thank you, uh, Assistant Kechi, for that question. Uh, Stephen, uh, go ahead, please. Are you unmuted? Thank you. Thank you so much to all the three speakers. And um, um <clears throat> These are very, very insightful, very, very um, um, evocative um, submissions. And I, I want to start with the last one by Dr. Berry, who talked about, you know, his research, which is really, really um, kind of um, eye-opening. And it speaks to the idea of um, local people owning the process. It's really more sustainable. It sounds like that is one of your findings, and which speaks to the way we work here at AFGM. So um, my question is this. The Sahel is very large. And it's not just one country, even though they are region, um, they have various cultures. And in a way, <clears throat> they are slightly different as much as they are almost similar. Do we think that the way we approach it, let's say from a local base, is to focus on it as a region or maybe to specifically address specific countries in terms of how, in other words, 
specific countries and their specific needs. So, for instance, issues around job for young people, issues around terrorism in areas where they are more, very much um, articulate, and issues around um, governance. So is this a comprehensive approach if for small organizations like us or even for local organizations who might want to address this? The second part is um, state failure. And I think um, Father Sane talked about state failure. Now, we all know state failure is a major issue in Africa. Generally, most countries where there are conflicts, you also have what they call limited statehood. The, country, the state is not able, even when it's willing, to be able to protect its, its boundaries. So therefore, people, it becomes an opportunistic conflict. Do you think that's a cause in, in, in the Sahel generally? Or do you think it's just, um, it's more of one of several things? In other words, it's not the main reason why, the, why this problem is. There are other external factors which are really causing it. Or do we think because of that, that's why we have France coming in with their impact on some other parts of the region, terrorism on, the, on some of the places as we have seen the jihad, and then these other issues. So these are two broad questions I have. One, on how we can approach it as a small organization or even locally. And two, what do we think is a major issue around it? I yield back. Thank you. All right. Before uh, answering, there is another question from Susan. Mm -hmm. How do you turn former combatants to be peace builders? Um, uh, Father Baz, go ahead and make a comment or a question yes. then. Yes, um, um, we take, uh, on, uh, um, so I would like just to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sane, Dr. Bere, and Colonel Sarah for this wonderful presentation. Um, my question is um, a little bit close to what um, you know um, uh, Dr. Rogers said. I would like to know how the competing interests of various actors, whether they are non-stake actors or you know state actors um undermine the search for peace in the Sahel. just you know give us a little bit insight into that you know we know that there are regional players but also we have international players and also we have religious players so how all those competing interests undermine the search for peace in the Sahel? thank you very good um, uh, Jeremy, uh, you can also open your mic and quickly make your comment or ask your question, and then we're gonna go for uh, the answer. Give um, uh, two okay. minutes uh, to each of the panelists, and that will be the closing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, all the guest speaker. This has been very insightful for me. And my first, it's actually a request: Is it possible to get the contact? detail of uh, your guest speaker, especially with uh, Dr. Matthew Bede. I'm working for a nonprofit organization and I'm really interested to learn more about his research about the community-led conflict resolution. That is a real question. And then my question is for the first two uh, speakers. Uh, I wanted to know from this perspective, how effective do they see the collaboration with Russia and China? You know, we are talking a lot about uh, Russia and China, but we need to learn about the story and uh, looking at, for instance, the example of Russia. If you look at the story of uh, Russia, I don't think that we can see any evidence where in the past, Russia has really helped any country to be, I mean, successful in, in, the, in this kind of situation. And uh, my belief is that uh, the, the conflict inside the, this situation will be really overcome when we are able to come up with a more holistic approach, including all the key players in this place. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Matt. If you want to give people your contact, you are welcome. Otherwise, I put my contact in the chat. You can email me and then I'll put you in contact with everybody. And um, now let's go ahead and give our panelists the last word, answering the, or, com uh, or commenting on what you said. Let me start with uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, uh, Sarah. Please. 
j'ai bien compris sa question, ce sont les perspectives. Hein. Les perspectives I, géopolitiques. I understood all your questions and um, uh, these are just perspectives on geopolitics of, uh, of the region. Bon, souvent quand on n'a pas la boule de cristal, c'est difficile de savoir ce qui va euh, advenir plus tard. Mais euh, pour le moment, je crois que euh, en même temps qu'on a des dynamiques de conflit, on a des dynamiques aussi de partenariat, de synergie. Et concernant la, la Russie et la, et la Chine, ce pas des pays que j'ai spécialement étudié, mais je crois je crois que ce sont des, des acteurs majeurs aussi, ce sont des grandes puissances qui, qui ont des intérêts en Afrique de manière générale et dans le Sahel, dans le Sahel de, de façon, voilà, pour parler spécifiquement. So, at the same time, uh, you have uh, dynamics within the conflict, you have also dynamics within the responses approach. I have not studied uh, Russia uh, deeply, But what we know is that um, uh, Russia is one of the superpowers which also deserve uh, equal chance to compete on the, in, uh, in uh, defending their interests uh, uh, wherever they, they see fit. Uh, je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu à la question ou bien il faut que je... No, si, uh, if, if that is your, your comment, uh, we can move to somebody else because we are in the, pro, uh, the last minute of our presentation. Thank you. Uh, let me take uh, uh, Father Sane next. Your okay, comment. Very, quick, very quickly, I would say this uh, concerning uh, Baz's uh, Baz question uh, about the, uh, some international NGOs. Yes, of course, they can really hijack our problem. And this is the, gen the danger there. When you have some NGOs who are there and they are talking in the name of the Africans facing their own problems, they can get more trust than the main concerned people themselves. And I think Dr. Matt mentioned it. Of course, we need uh, social and humanitarian assistance. That is the main focus of... Uh, these international NGOs, but we need more sustainable, consistent, and efficient approaches of our problems. The reason why it's interesting to have Africa Fish Justice Network being a part of this uh, root understanding of the question. For sending the second uh, a question from Jeremiah, I think, uh, Russia and China. Of course, Russia and, Ka and China are not angelic countries. And I don't think people are calling them to say, let us re replace a colonizer by another one. No, people are just willing to tell the former colonial countries, please, we are enough intelligent and smart to collaborate with. We want Russia, China, and everybody in this planet, including people living in planet Mars. You don't have to tell us with whom we, we should collaborate. And finally, I will say this, the main question is about how do we go to these countries? Are they good people or bad people? I don't think this is our interest. What can we gain with them? And finally, the saviors of Africans will be Africans themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matt. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, in fact, there are very interesting questions that have been asked here. Some of them uh, especially the question of Keshi um, uh, is answered in my, in my report. Uh, she wants to know who are the people taking local initiatives. So uh, she can access my, my full report online. Now, uh, the other questions are about the responses to the, to the crisis uh, and uh, um, the role of international actors, especially the conflict of interest, how it undermines the search for peace in, in the Sahel. This is a question by Father Bazemou. Uh, in fact, for those who have had to manage projects like me, working with international actors and local governors like the UN agency, USAID, uh, UNDP, or national government of the country, you can see 
that when it comes to peace building, people don't always have the same agenda, nor the same priorities, right? We are all talking about peace, but peace is colored by, by interest, geopolitical interest, commercial interest, uh, sometimes religious interest. Uh, and people don't invest the same way in different countries. A country like Burkina Faso is, is by all standards poorer and in need than a country like Nigeria or Cameroon. And yet Cameroon and Nigeria will receive more development aid than Burkina Faso. And when people in the same country don't have the same level of interest, the same geopolitical interest or economic interest, it's very difficult for them to come up with the same agenda to advance peace and security, right? Why do you think that the government of Mali or Burkina Faso ended up asking the French to withdraw their troops? Or ask MINUSMA to leave the country, which is a UN uh, mission, peacekeeping mission that they themselves requested back in 2013. So things are not that simple uh, when people talk about peace. Uh, anyway, I'll stop here. Thank you so much uh, for all your remarks. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists and stay tuned to our, the next steps in this conversation. We have gone beyond our allocated time, but I think it is with good reason. Uh, the, the Sahel region deserves our attention and thus we, we allow ourselves to go over time. And we will continue to go over time until every person in the Sahel knows that we are not silent. To be silent is to consent. We do not consent to what is happening to them. I would like to give back the floor to our executive director so that he can finish this meeting, which he started. Let me, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bahati. And um, let me just close this again by thanking our well-articulate um, three panelists, um, Lieutenant Cornell, Alain Sarah, um, um, Father Dr. Um, um, Father Sane, um, AFJ, and the senior, um, senior member of our fellowship, and um, Dr. Barrett. Three, three very wonderful um, presentations, and uh, including the research which she shared with us, which we hope we'll have access to. This event is actually the beginning of series of activities um, that AFGN is, is highlighting. The idea is to highlight the governance and humanitarian issues in Sahel, but to provide that opportunity from an African perspective, including people like you who have the lived experience, but also very highly articulate and intellectual folks who can speak to it in a way that other people cannot. And that's why we are very happy with this panel. And the last part is to really find organic and local solutions to the problems in our regions of Africa, especially in the Sahel in this case, and to see how we can solve those problems. So we are hoping that these conversations, including your questions, will, will be able to invite us to be very thoughtful about how we can develop programs and to see how we can be effective in a region. On that, I wanna thank you all for coming and we hope that you can join us as we move this discussion to the next level. Thank you and thank you Bahati for moderating this so well. Thanks. <laughs>